Thank you for joining us for the January 2019 edition of Forage Focus. Today's show will be centered around soil health and starting to rejuvenate some of those winter sacrifice areas and really the 2018 sacrifice areas that we've had due to the saturated conditions throughout the year. Looking forward into 2019, we hope that our struggles will be less than in 2018 and we are always here to provide resources for you. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching the January 2019 edition of Forage Focus. I'm your host, Christine Gelly, and my guest today on the show is Erica Lyon. Erica is the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator for Jefferson and Harrison Counties. Thank you for joining us on the show today, Erica. Could you tell us a bit about what you do in your counties? Thank you, Christine. Absolutely. So, as Christine mentioned, I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator um, for Jefferson and Harrison Counties, and if you're familiar with those two counties, they are on the far eastern side of the state. Um, we have a lot of rolling hills, a lot of pasture, uh, also a lot of woodlands as well. Um, and if you're familiar with that area, you know that it has a history of uh, coal mining activity and there's a lot of reclamation going on. So we certainly have deal with some issues with soil health. Um, my background is actually in mycology and plant pathology, so that's kind of how I got started in soil health. I come from it more from the fungi perspective. Um, so I talk a lot about mycorrhizal fungi and how it relates to the soil. Could you explain that a little bit? What are those types of fungi? Sure. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi are a type of uh, beneficial fungi. They're described as having a mutualistic relationship with plants. Um, the plants are getting better access to nutrients and water, and in return, these fungi are getting carbon from the plant. They come with a variety of benefits. They um, help plants fight off disease. Uh, they help plants tolerate more stressful environments uh, and a variety of other benefits as well. Well, today's topic is going to focus on soil health and particularly uh, trying to recover the health of our soils after such a saturated year like we had in 2018. Many people's pastures are already damaged before we went into winter with all the animal traffic and just how wet everything has been. So what do saturated conditions like that do in general for soil health? Well, they certainly aren't great, especially if we're talking about raising livestock and pastures. Uh, they're going to be out there during those wet times. Um, and if you have a bunch of animals standing in the same spot at the same time, what you're going to start to see is the area is going to get muddy. We're familiar with those conditions right now, or at least a couple days ago. Uh, and what ends up happening is that soil becomes more and more compacted. Uh, how this affects soil health is with that compaction, it's more difficult for plant roots to grow outwards and access those nutrients that they need. Um, Before we dive into that deeper, I think that you've prepared some slides for us today to kind of describe uh, some, some of the things that are really important about soil health and soil structure. Do you want to take us through some of those now? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the first one I have up is uh, what is soil health exactly? Uh, but before we get into soil health, we first have to talk about what, what is soil? What does it mean? Um, soil is not just dirt, there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, first of all, uh, soil is about 45% roughly uh, mineral material. This is material that uh, is there mostly eroded from the bedrock underneath or the parent material. Uh, soil is also made of air and water. Uh, this is something that we don't oftentimes associate with soil, but uh, soil is not so completely solid. There's a lot of pore space in it, and within these pore spaces you have water and air. Uh, some other things that you might have, uh, especially in the top couple inches of soil, are going to be microbes and macroinvertebrates. These are contributing to the organic matter that's in that soil. 
Soil health contributes to plant productivity in that healthy soils tend to have sufficient depth for roots to grow. This actually allows our forage crops to become more resilient during stressful conditions such as drought. When we talk about soil health, we also talk about carbon sequestration. Healthy soils are able to retain carbon that's been taken out of the atmosphere and hold it underground. A lot of times when we think about soil health too, we're equating it with erosion control. When we have healthy soils, we generally have good ground cover with a good root system that is holding in those soils to prevent losses during rainfall events. And one of the ways that we can monitor our soil health is look for vegetation changes, especially if we reseeded our pasture uh, in recent years. Did what ended up coming up, was that the plant that we wanted or did we end up with a pro weed problem? A lot of times we see weeds appear where our, soil, our soils are not uh, conducive for the plants that we wanted to grow to grow. So it's really way more complex than just a series of dirt, huh? There's all kinds of living creatures in there. Oh yeah, um, I've heard of some uh, folks talk about um, soil microbes as the underground livestock that you have to manage as well as the above ground livestock. When I talk about underground livestock, I'm referring to the large populations of beneficial soil biota that we have in our pastures, in our fields. These might consist of nitrogen-fixing bacteria, such as legumes. Uh, these nitrogen-fixing bacteria are actually able to take atmospheric nitrogen that plants cannot uptake and turn it into a form that plants can readily use. We also have our, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi that make their home in plant roots. When we talk about fungi, fungi have these structures called hypha, they're thread-like filamentous material, and they grow outward in the soil. These hypha are able to produce some substances that help bind soil particles together, uh, forming macro and micro aggregates that are so critical for our soil structures. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the arbuscular mycorrhizae, they're important for, nu for nutrient exchange. Here you see these, in this middle photo, you see these fluffy-like structures. Those are called arbuscular, arbuscules, and that is where phosphorus exchange is readily occurring, uh, as well as other nutrients. We also have our friends, the earthworms, that are burrowing through the soil and also contribute to soil structure through the development of micropores. keep talking about this soil structure. So what exactly is soil structure? It's certainly a concept that we can't overlook for when we're talking about soil health in our pastures and fields. Soil structure is defined by the arrangement of soil pores and the ways particles will clump together or aggregate. I talked earlier about soil aggregates, which are essentially small, small clumps of soil. Good soil structure will contain both larger pores called macropores and small pores that are known as micropores. I like to think of soils like a sponge. A good sponge is able to absorb a large amount of water. It doesn't necessarily have pores of a uniform size. In fact, when you have tillage going on in a field, it's reducing those macropores and creating uh, more micropores in the soil that's makes it more difficult for plant roots to grow outward and pick up water that is stored in those micropores. Uh, a way to improve soil structure is to add organic matter to those soils, um, especially if they don't have much organic matter to begin with or they don't have much ground cover. Organic matter allows soils to become more sponge-like so they can take on more water. When we have, oftentimes when we have waterlogged soils, one of the issues might be that there wasn't enough organic matter to begin with, and that led to the current situation. So the water just ended up, maybe the soils were more compacted, and the water just ended up sitting on top. I talked earlier about a substance that mycorrhizal fungi release. Uh, this is called glomalin. Uh, you can actually see this in the photo on the right here. Uh, the glom glomalin appears it as this uh, greenish glowing material on the plant root system. This is important for soil structure by helping to form those aggregates. Soils are teeming with life, so that's great for soil structure. 
Uh, glomalin is kind of like a soil glue. It binds particles together uh, and helps develop more of those macro pores that we want. That's a really good way to look at it, I think. Absolutely. And there's millions of them. And they all benefit each other. The thing about soil health is it's more of a systems approach. You have to look at the whole, the big picture. So what are the other pieces of that picture? So one of the things that um, soil health is defined as, or at least by the NRCS, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, is that soil health is the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Uh, so soil is it's a substance that, grow, that your plants can grow in. Um, it also can be a nightmare if it's not properly maintained, like right now with the muddy situation that we have. So we're in that type of a nightmare. What kinds of things do we need to understand about our soil structure to, uh, to rejuvenate the health in a way that's appropriate? You mentioned this, that parent material, and um, how does that fit in in the grand scheme of things? Well, parent material is usually um, depends on the location that you're at. It might be several feet down, uh, two tens uh, or feet down in the soil. So usually we're more focused on what's at the surface. Uh, that's where a lot of your organic matter, uh, I believe I have a slide in here um, that talks about the soil horizons and soil depth. Um, First off, you have the O layer, or your, your layer that has the organic material, and this is where a lot of your roots are going to be located, as well as in the, what's known as the A horizon. Um, and that's also where a lot of your soil microbes are going to be, and that darker layer of soil. Uh, below that is the B horizon, uh, which is your subsoils. You're starting to get more into your subsoils. Below that is C, so on, um, and then below that is going to be the parent material. The parent material does influence the soils above um, in terms of, especially when we think about, for example, limestone versus shale. Uh, limestone parent material tends to make soils uh, more basic, whereas, um, or at least increases that buffer capacity in that soil. For, so that affects how you apply lime or sulfur and how fast it will interact with the soil. Um, shale soils tend to be more acidic, or shale parent material. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, so would our soil acidity be affected at all by the saturated conditions that we've had? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it certainly can be. Uh, one of the big things that I think about when we talk about saturated soils is nitrogen. Um, soil, um, nitrogen is a big component and if you're familiar with uh, what happens in denitrification, that slide here. Uh, so you first have to understand the nitrogen cycle. You have um, nitrogen gas in the atmosphere that's not accessible to plants in that current form. So that's why you have um, free living bacteria on the roots of legumes that help fix um, that nitrogen in the, in the soil. And that nitrogen eventually can go through several processes, mineralization, which makes it more available, uh, or nitrification. Um, and some of those products are going to be ammonium or nitrate. Um, it's this nitrate that uh, is impacted by waterlogged soils. Uh, what ends up happening is when you have waterlogged soils, uh, you don't quite have Whole lot of oxygen. There's nowhere for those microbes to get the oxygen from. So where do they look next? Mm -hmm. Nitrate is NO3. Yep. NO3. <laughs> um, so it's going to break apart. They're going to break apart that uh, nitrate molecule and uh, you're going to have nitrogen loss to the atmosphere. Um, so that's an important part of waterlogged soils. So what about phosphorus and potassium? We've talked about nitrogen, but waterlogged soils can also impact the uptake of these nutrients as well. Uh, with waterlogged soils, they primarily impact the root system of forages, uh, such as with the function and development of these roots. And because of this, phosphorus and potassium can be limited in their uptake. So let's say we've got, we have bare exposed soil. It's compacted. It's low on nutrients. How are we going to start approaching that? How are we going to fix that? So that's something um, 
where you start talking about pasture renovation, uh, it's certainly a hot topic right now. Um, one of the first things, uh, if, it, if it is raining out um, and you're having waterlogged conditions uh, and you're grazing, it's best to have a, sacri a sacrificial paddock or a sacrificial lot that your animals will be on so you don't end up ruining the entire pasture and having to receive it all. You just have to receive one, um, one or two areas. Uh, you could uh, install a heavy use pad. This is certainly helpful uh, in minimizing those muddy conditions as well. Um, when it comes time to renovate, um, you can use frost seeding, uh, certain legumes are good uh, to get a head start on that season, but they won't start germinating until soils actually warm up. Uh, come springtime, uh, we always say don't get a soil test, so it's best to get a soil test done so you know what nutrients are available in the soil. Um, if you've never done a soil test before, please contact your local county extension office and somebody would be happy to help you complete a soil test and get it to a laboratory and then help you interpret your results as well. Just yep, a absolutely. note. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with pasture renovation, um, you want to make sure that the conditions are right for those seedlings uh, to establish themselves. So you're going to probably have to do a bit of um, renovating the site. Um, one of the big things, as I mentioned before, that you see with waterlogged soils is that soils become compacted, so you'll have to find a way to uh, minimize or remove that compaction issue. Um, adding organic matter certainly helps, uh, sometimes more um, technical work is required, such as using a ripper. Hopefully we don't get to that, but especially if you're de dealing with hard pans below um, soil surface that when that might justify that um, but certainly you want to have those seedlings get off to a good start and uh, soil compaction is going to be a major problem for that. Erica a question that comes to mind is um, if we know that our, our soils are low in nutrients and we want to get some fertilizer on there uh, is when is the best time to actually apply that fertilizer should I be proactive as soon as I have a, a a day where the weather's nice, or do I need to wait longer than that before I put fertilizer on? Well, you, you'll have your starter fertilizer that you'll apply with plants when you need them. Um, it's best to incorporate, like for example, if you need to apply a lime to correct the soil pH, it's best to do that in the fall before the growing season. Of course, that's always, not always possible if you have a winter like this one, and you're looking to renovate in the spring. Um, one thing when you're applying nutrients, we want to prevent those nutrients from running off into our watershed, so um, you don't want to apply them when there's a downpour, uh, but at the same time you want them to get incorporated in the soil surface layer. Okay, so we don't want to apply before the plant actually needs it, otherwise that's a waste, right? We're mm -hmm. probably going to have yeah, more. we're going to get nitrogen losses. Nitrogen is the most mobile um, of the nutrients, so that one can be lost fairly easy, easily. So do you have any advice for providing soil cover right now while it's still winter and before spring gets here? It's not really ideal to establish forages right now. We have bare soil, it's mucked up, we've probably already sacrificed a bunch of areas. Is there any other type of cover that we could put down to help preserve the soil in the meantime? Really the best thing that you can do is let those areas uh, rest for a while, um, the ones that you're wanting to save and make sure you're using those sacrificial areas or um, heavy use pads. Um, in the meantime, uh, it's just best to keep, keep anything heavy from moving over that soil that's going to further compact it down. Um, one of the things that um, is important in soil health is uh, infiltration. Infiltration is important, uh, especially when we talk about water, because plant roots need water and they need that water to make it into the soil where they are actively growing. Uh, infiltration is how water moves through the soil. Going back to thinking about a sponge, when you slowly add water, it takes time for that water to occupy those pores and move further downwards. This is why when you see heavy rainfall events, that water might not be getting absorbed in the soil, especially if it's a really quick event. It's just running off the surface. So talking about infiltration, there are certain conditions that will inhibit infiltration. 
Uh, for example, soils with no ground cover might crust over and they will not be able to absorb water right away due to the development of a seal over the surface. We can certainly use tillage to break up the crust, but what ends up usually happening is the tillage removes many of those macropores that I talked about earlier in the soil and can lead to compaction issues later on where you have a bunch of micropores that your plant roots can't reach to get water. Furthermore, tillage is not great for the soil's microbial community. For example, fungal hyphae or that thread-like network that is responsible for the transport of nutrients actually gets broken up uh, when it is tilled and it takes time to recover. So you might not see that benefit when you're tilling the soil. High field traffic and flooding can further cause compaction, which is not great for microbes either, well, especially when we talk about fungi. Fungi are aerobic. They need oxygen to thrive. When we have waterlogged soils or high traffic areas with soil compaction, we're reducing that soil oxygen because we're removing pore space. And this creates anaerobic conditions that those fungi just have a hard time developing in. So like you said, making sure that we get organic matter back mm -hmm. into that system is going to be more beneficial in the long run? Yes, absolutely. Organic matter and making sure that there's some sort of ground cover and uh, root systems that are going to provide later to pour that organic matter. Okay. Or build up the organic matter. Where are, um, where are some of the places that people could go to learn more about uh, these topics like soil health or get technical assistance through their counties. There's always the Ohio State University Extension. Feel free to stop by. We have soil fertility test kits that you can pick up. They're only, they, it depends on what office you stop, stop at to purchase them from, but they're usually 10 to $15 uh, a piece. Uh, and what those will tell you is m more about your soil pH, uh, you should always start by first correcting your soil pH before you start tackling the other nutrients. Um, they'll also give you in more information on phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Um, soil tests do not provide, or at least the standard uh, tests that we have at the office don't provide information for nitrogen just because nitrogen is so mobile in the, in the soil, it's hard to get a, a good idea of what actually is there. Uh, so usually they'll have standard recommendations for nitrogen. Uh, another place to work with uh, would be your local soil and water conservation district or your natural resources conservation service. Uh, they do a lot of work with soil, with soil health and they can provide more technical assistance as well. Okay, Erica. Well, thank you for sharing uh, these resources with us today. If anybody has a question specifically for you, are they able to contact you through email or phone? Absolutely. Uh, feel free to reach me at uh, our office phone is 740-264-2212. Uh, I'm primarily based out of the Jefferson County office, even though I'm in two counties. Uh, so that's the best number to re reach me at. You can also reach me via email uh, at lion.194 at osu.edu. And that's lion with a Y, not an I. Hey, that's, <laughs> that's a good way to say that. Well, thank you for watching our show today. Join us next time in February for Forage Focus. Thanks again for watching Forage Focus. Feel free to access any of the Ohio State University fact sheets referenced on the screen or contact your county extension educator for more information about how to rejuvenate pastures in your specific production system. Thanks everybody for watching us. Wait, are we starting now? No, we're just doing our test. <laughs> we're watching us on Forage Focus today. The computer is a little bit distracting. Can we like... Could we put it off to the side? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Feedback. La, 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 la. Okay. And hopefully you can't see the pepper that's stuck in our teeth. Mycorrhizal fungi.
Can so, you explain to to our audience a little bit what exactly does that mean? Micro micro rhizal fungi. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen more minutes in here. Pardon? We have. We're, we're trying to record fifteen minutes of a oh. TV show, and then we'll be all done. Okay. So when's it? Uh, certainly. Um, the there's always oh, oh, cut. There's always Ohio State University extension. Uh, feel free to stop by and ask us questions. Oh, hey. I just wanted to know if there were still people here. Yeah, we're almost done. We need just like 10 more minutes. Okay. If that's okay. Uh, Ohio State University Extension can provide some technical. I probably should have waited until the door shut. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I am so sorry to whoever is editing <laughs> this. <laughs> we have a few editors Sarah, Dwayne, Patrick. Thank you. Third. <laughs> um, There's always the Ohio State University. That should be our. That should be our thing instead of we sustain life. There's always the Ohio <laughs> There's State. There's always University. the Ohio State University.